social media, when your profile starts to grow, you're suddenly hit with this kind of wave of judgment and and there the sexism becomes a bit harder. Um, you will experience it a little bit behind the camera, you will. When I think I've grown up in a generation where we're really lucky that I think all of the hard work was already done and that path, I think, was really paved by um, the proper trailblazers like Gabby, Gabby Logan and Claire Balding and um, Sue Barker. And when I was younger and I used to watch Question of Sport or the Olympics coverage and things like that, those were the women that never, they didn't look out of place to me at all. So when I considered getting into broadcasting, that element of um, women in a male-dominated um, arena, it didn't really resonate with me. And even when I got into it as a runner, I I noticed it was slightly under, quite underrepresented. Um, slightly. <laughs> behind, yeah. <laughs> behind the camera more so that the work that you do in front of the camera you can put as many as many females in front of the camera as you want if it's not mirrored behind the camera it, it's lip service in a way I think um they have to come hand in hand because I think it reflects on each other and I think as well like having more women behind the camera it helps that dynamic and it helps that relationship massively too um I think it makes for a really healthy um environment to work in so when I was growing up those those women that I named were so comfortable in their position, I had no idea what might be happening behind the camera or how difficult it might have been for them. I've since read parts of Gabby's book where she talks about sexism that she's experienced and and it's horrible, you know, and, and I think, wow, how difficult was that? Whereas where I've come from, I probably had a, a tenth of that experience. Where I experienced it more was social media. When your profile starts to grow, you're suddenly hit with this kind of wave of judgment and and there the sexism becomes a bit harder. Um, you will experience it a little bit behind the camera, you will. Um, but I think that there are things in place and support in place so much more now for my generation than there ever was with, with that generation before. And what's the judgment for when you do get hit with the sort of tsunami of, 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 of comment? What, what, what are they talking about? Is it that you don't know what you're talking about? Or is it about mm. how you look? Or is it about, yeah. you know, what, 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 do, what do they zoom in on? Or is it all of the above? There's, there's all of that, all of that. But I, I remember at the beginning of my career, like you can hear nervousness in people's voices and that was me and and I think everybody is and whenever I talk about the beginning part of my career I always say I was crap because I don't know anybody that's naturally gone from talking to somebody in, in general to then speaking to a camera lens and it being really natural and I if you've got it like uh, this right? I mean yeah. really slowly and yeah. really flat it was awful I don't know how they kept I, me on same and I look back and I think god no wonder it took me so long because I was dreadful but all of that experience comes um, with the miles that you get under your belt and then the confidence comes from that. So I remember being it almost like where a shark can smell blood. That is that is somebody on Twitter going, oh, I, I, I hear nervousness in her voice. And then they'll come for you. And then it's almost like they, they, they've got their own reasons. And usually trolls, for example, it's more of a reflection of how they feel about themselves that they're looking to seek out somebody to, to be aggressive to or to abuse. Um, but it did take me a long time to get over that because they felt very sharp. They felt like barbs that were thrown at you. And you could have 20 really nice tweets and one nasty one. And the nasty one would sit in your mind forever and you'd think, maybe I do have a big nose or, or maybe my voice is stupid and little things like that. And gradually, as you get a bit older, you, you have to filter it out, but you have to filter out the good as well with it so so how do you cope with it now i mean i totally mm. agree with you I, I kind of think take no notice of any of it you know if someone says you're brilliant then you know take that with yeah. the same pinch of salt and actually i think trying not to read it is actually um, yeah you know the the healthiest way exactly. forward but uh, how do you cope you have to like protect your own arena and there is um brene brown is a, a brilliant broadcaster and she's like a motivational speaker she speaks a lot about nobody can judge you unless they have been in the arena with you or on the stage with you and kind of walked in in your um, shoes. So as soon as you kind of understand that and think, I will only take criticism from, or constructive criticism as well, from somebody that understands the position that I'm in and can actually help me with my career rather than somebody outside that doesn't know what's going on in, in this world to, to criticise you like that. You've got to try and just let it, um, roll off your shoulders as much as possible. Otherwise, you will be bogged down so much that it becomes unbearable. 
but there was a I really wish I could remember which one it was. There was a um a football manager who early on in my career I was interviewing him and he said you can't it was like he had a brilliant win or something like that and I was like wow waxing lyrical about it and he was like you can't get too highs with the highs in the same way you can't get too lows with the low you have to try and stay like this like the duck sort of sitting comfortably on the water um and don't let it rock you either way otherwise you can get really you can get drowned in your own success as well and, and all these compliments are flying your way You're like brilliant that can trip you up as much as the negative side of things I was. Um, I, I, I'm sure you are very well aware that, that that Man United were beaten by Liverpool seven 0 <laughs> yeah, at the yeah. weekend. I did it, hear. It was a, it was a horrible moment in our house because I've got two <gasps> Man United no. uh, fans. But weirdly, it made me think back to Qatar because one of the things that people were talking about during the World Cup was the incidence of domestic violence rising. Yeah. Tournament with football. England's defeat mm -hmm. uh, in particular, but with with football in mm. general. How much do you come into contact with that kind of element of toxic masculinity, I guess, mm. that, that's involved with, with, with football? Because mm. funnily enough, I, or not funnily enough, uh, I, I was thinking about it on, on, on Sunday night, which was just a weird thought to have. And I thought, mm. oh, 7-0, that's going to be really bad somewhere in yeah. the country. And it's a horrible thing to, yeah. to think. We, on TalkSport, we... Um, this is why I'm, I'm very lucky to have that job, because... It is four hours where they will support anything that you really want to explore. And in the time that I've been hosting on it Mondays to Wednesdays, I um, we've been able to cover all sorts of topics. We took that show over in lockdown, so we didn't have any live sport. Day one was day one of lockdown. So what that forced us to do was look into kind of more um, social topics and more um, personal topics with our listeners. And we've experienced stories in the world of sport which are about domestic violence. And one thing that we, we wanted to do was we, we don't like to shy away from it and actually have that conversation more readily and more openly um, because those statistics are shocking and we've, we've looked at them a lot. Domestic, domestic violence rises with tournament football, especially in the summer especially in the summer, for some reason, um, it rises. And, and you're right, when there are defeats and, and there will always be a, a loss of defeat or draw, whatever, every weekend, um, you will see the figures and they, and they tie together. So we try and have those open conversations. We try and say it's not just women that experience domestic violence, it's men as well. And if you are listening and you need help, here are the places that you can get help. Um, if you're listening and you are the person that is the, um, the violent one in the relationship, you need to get help too. Here are ways you can get it. And why do you think there is that connection? I mean, that's the thing that, that I'm sort of baffled by. I mean, maybe because I'm not a huge sports fan, so yeah. like football isn't isn't life and death yeah. uh, to me. But, but you know, I, 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 I find it really hard to understand where that causal link comes from. Well, it's an explosion of emotion and football is incredibly tribal and it, and it will be tied to their feelings from when they were children. That is where their loyalties lie. And, and football also is a kind of arena where in the past you, you can almost enter it and when there were real problems with football hooliganism and, and racism, and we aren't out of that yet by any stretch of the imagination, but there was a, a time perhaps 20 years ago where it was so much more rife, 30 years ago, so much more prevalent in football and in the stands than it is today. And it almost was like you could walk into that arena and the laws of, of an, a normal public person don't count because this is football and, and we are a tribe. And I think perhaps it's a hangover from that, but also it, sport in general, it, it just is that overbuilding of emotion. And if you have a tendency and, and you have a problem with domestic violence in your family already, that is where it's going to feel incredibly heightened. And, and more often than not, alcohol is, is involved in this too. Laura, we talked at the beginning, or at least I mentioned at the beginning, uh, you know, making your presenter reels and, and, and mm -hmm. your YouTube videos yeah. in your garage, and you've come a very long way since then. What's your career to date taught you about the possibility of achieving your dreams? Because you must have been a young girl mm. with a very big dream that mustn't have seemed at the time particularly potentially realisable. Yeah, I, I think... I think it's kind of never to feel like you are beaten, you know, like never to feel um, 
that you aren't going to be able to get somewhere because really if you if you really want it and you work hard at that which sounds like a real cliche doesn't it but if you've got that realistic logical goal in your head there's really nothing stopping you from just practicing keep on practicing and I remember at the beginning of my um career I, I was a runner and I was working behind the scenes and then I became a producer and I learned all of those skills and I watched presenters and I and I figured out how they work and I found it fascinating um, and I wanted to put all of that passion that I had into something and I think that helps if you're super passionate about it it doesn't feel like you're doing extra hours or extra homework um, so that kind of repetition I think is so key if you want to be a presenter because you're not going to do it overnight so you have to have as many um, experiences and make as many mistakes as you can. And it's horrible, isn't it? Like the like making a mistake as a presenter, you're making it... Um, they hang around forever. You're, you're <laughs> making it with like, everyone's got the ability to record now, social media will go on fire and it will be, you'll be trending for days and that is incredibly frustrating and you feel really vulnerable. But I think the one thing that I probably have learned coming through this whole career is, um, is you, yeah, you just kind of you shouldn't really ever feel like you are beaten because you can kind of control that. If you really want to, you can control it. And just finally, um, if you were able to play a sport particularly brilliantly, um, are we talking ping pong or football? <laughs> or where does the passion lie? Well, when I was younger, I was a very good gymnast and I was a very good rugby player. And then when I got to, I think it was 14, you weren't allowed to play with the boys anymore. And I wanted to because all of my friends were in that rugby team. So instead of going and joining the girls, I just stopped altogether. Um, but I think, and I, I loved rugby. I thought it was wonderful. But I think now um, it would be football. Yeah, it would be because I was so average at football when I was younger and we didn't have the facilities. We didn't have football teams for girls at school or anything like that. So that would have been a bit harder. But I think being as engrossed in it as I am, I watch it now and I also watch the, the standard of the women's game growing too. And I think, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great to just go and have a kick about and not embarrass yourself? <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah. Just go and play in a charity match or something. It'd be wonderful. Absolutely. What would be what would be your sign? You know, what is it called when you when you scored a goal? You know, they all have this. Oh, my celebration. What would be your celebration? Because my son seems to spend more time. I mean, he's a good football player, but he seems to spend more time working out his celebration <laughs> than his actual <laughs> tactics. I know, right? And the, Mar the Marcus Rashford one is very like. Just he loves that. Put, put the thing to, to the side of your temple, or like the old school, like Aaron Allen like holding your finger up would be quite fun wouldn't it it would be something understated it wouldn't be like a, a sue or anything like that Cristiano Ronaldo he's not my favorite anyway it would be there we go we'll go with the Marcus Rashford one <laughs>